Okay, I think, can you hear me? Yes, okay, we're gonna get started. Hello and welcome, my name is Lisa Melandri. I'm the executive director here at CAM St. Louis. We are truly thrilled to be part of the Four Freedoms 50 State Initiative, which has been raising awareness about how artists and arts organizations can be more directly involved in public life. Tonight, we are delighted to host this town hall, and we are really fortunate in St. Louis because we have all of the sort of platforms of the Four Freedoms Initiative around us. We have exhibitions at Projects Plus Gallery and the Cranesburg Arts Center, yard signs across the city, and three billboards on view. And we are also very, very proud to welcome Hank Willis Thomas as one of our panelists, who, along with Eric Gottesman, is a Four Freedoms co-founder. Four Freedoms takes its name from the historic Four Freedoms, F-O-U-R, speech of President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who articulated the basic freedoms for people around the world. Freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom from fear, and freedom from want. These words were among the first to describe basic human rights and stood in contrast to the rise of fascism in the 1930s. Four Freedoms is also inspired by Norman Rockwell, who created a series of paintings to visually connect Roosevelt's world to a whole other range of audiences. So just to give you a sense, I'd like to just quote a bit from the mission of Four Freedoms. Quote, we believe citizenship is defined by participation, not by ideology. Through nonpartisan nationwide programming, we use art as a vehicle for participation to deepen public discussions on civic issues and core values. Tonight's town hall centers around, this to dis around the discussion of one of those very important core values, freedom of speech, especially as it involves protest and the ballot box. Our panelists, our esteemed panelists, include Hank Willis Thomas, as I mentioned, Representative Bruce Franks Jr. from Missouri House District 78 in St. Louis, Nicole Hudson, Assistant Vice Chancellor for the Academy for Diversity and Inclusion at Washington University in St. Louis, Rachel Lippman, Criminal Justice and City Politics Reporter at St. Louis Public Radio, and Tef Poe, Rapper, Artist, and Activist based in St. Louis. Thank you so much for joining us. It is our pleasure to have you here. I would like also to take this opportunity to thank the people who helped make this happen. Black Puffin Art Consulting, St. Louis Public Radio, and the Gephardt Institute for Civic and Community Engagement at Washington University, and specifically Denise Ward-Brown. I also extend my gratitude to Susan Barrett at Barrett Barrera, who's done so much to help all of these initiatives for Four Freedoms happen in St. Louis. And I definitely also very much wish to thank CAM Assistant Curator Misa Jeffries for being our sort of logistical maven in making all of this work. We have asked, just a little bit of a run of show, we've asked each of our panelists to speak for approximately 10 minutes. Following their remarks, we will invite you to all come to this mic, in fact, to share your questions, your comments, your observations. The only ask that we have is if you can keep those comments to approximately a minute, we'll be able to have as many of you participate as possible. So thank you so much for coming to CAM so that we can take a look at what democracy looks like, indeed. And I want to welcome Hank Willis Thomas, who is our first speaker of the evening. Thank you. Oh. Thanks. Well, I was hoping just to stand behind it, but I realized it wasn't going to be hiding much. <laughs> um, hi, everyone. How are you? Um, it's great to be here in St. Louis and at CAM, and I'm grateful to everyone for bringing me here and to see some old friends and family. And Four Freedoms 50 State Initiative was really born out of a hope um, of coming together with all the incredible creative minds that I know because I realized that um, the thing that artists do very well, um, usually, that a lot of people in our society don't do well, especially politicians, is critique and accept criticism as a form of growth. Typically in our, in our civic life, it's expected that everyone who runs for office or is participating in elected office is was born perfect and could never have made any other decision 
um, than the ones that they did that were right all the time. And there's therefore harder to get people to take accountability for the for what they do and how they're uh, responding to things. And what I noticed in places like th this is that um, there are places where people come to with open minds. A lot of the work on the walls, people don't expect to get in a simple way. And there's a lot of work that's being done to like try to get people to engage with the deeper issues. So I like to say that good art asks questions and good design answers them. Um, in the art, a lot of reason, a lot of people are unsettled when they say, like, I don't get it, when they look at a work of art. And I've become more comfortable with being like, oh, good, <laughs> because that's, now we can talk. Um, if it is, it, it's, it's very easy to become propaganda if someone looks at something and they can deduce it so simply, which is um, almost like clickbait, which is, um, and, and so part of what we're hoping is that we can raise a level of critical discourse in um, our society through the same kind of humbling and humble approaches that artists make work. And we believe that um, museums, galleries, uh, um, colleges and, and libraries are some of the few places where people go to um, today with an open mind. They're not going necessarily to, um, with a presumption of what they're going to kind of come away with. And in these spaces, which really are civic spaces, they're the space in which um, new ideas come into the conversation and hopefully they can grow. But we feel that these civic spaces need to be claimed as such and that artists should be thinking of themselves and be seen as civic leaders because um, we have a lot of um, about, like uh, non-creative people designing our society through the laws that they're that they're writing in the ways that they're problem solving problems in the same old ways. And we need more civic leaders to see themselves um, as creatives and, and take creative approaches um, with critical thinking and hopefully as a public be willing to um, encourage and allow our leaders to grow um, rather than always being so cynical. And I think for me, it has a lot to do with this way in which um, so many times I've come to see art, I'm like, I hate that, I don't get it, blah, blah, blah. And then you talk to the artist, or you go see a talk, or you talk to someone who likes it, who you respect, you're like, oh, I hadn't thought about it that way. And then I can then become an advocate for something that I actually had a lot of disdain for <laughs> before. And, uh, and we think that, you, do you guys know that more people go to colleges, go to museums annually than they go to um, sports events? Which is kind of incredible to when you really think about that. And therefore, uh, the 50 State Initiative was the hope to do what if everyone we, could, we knew in our network um, could do something simultaneously under the banner of FOR Freedoms. Because as for freedoms, we, ha we um, are for freedoms that we actually personally don't necessarily agree with because we think that in order to be thinking forward, you have to always approach things with an open mind. We feel like it's important to be visionary, not reactionary. Um, in my own work, I can be as reactionary as I want. <laughs> um, but there is, a, I think, as a collective, there has to be more space for new ideas and new approaches. And so we're collaborating with 250 institutions across the country, about 400 artists. Uh, there's great exhibitions um, like Cry of Freedom here at Project Plus Gallery. And thank you to Modu um, for, for, for helping get this billboard project up and so many other connections. But it's just been astounding to see the ways in which all of these institutions and, and people have kind of taken their own approach. And we have about 150 billboards up across the country with over 100 artists. And it's the largest creative collaboration in American history. I, uh, well, I took a line, I, I was inspired by our president. He was like, it doesn't matter if that's true. <laughs> <laughs> but it's impressive, right? <laughs> Prove me wrong, <laughs> um, uh, which is, is part of a whole another digression. But it, the digression is that we're the storytellers and we need to be creating the narratives for the things that we care about, because the truth is what you believe. We have been taught that the truth is some empirical thing that you can prove. But the truth is what you believe and what you can get other people to believe. So why not set about making our dreams come true, which is what we do when, I, when we manifest things in, when, within the art world. And so um, I had a few things, a few quotes that I 
wanted to remember to say. <laughs> um, thinking a lot about times like this, it's really important to recognize that our time is no less challenging than any other time um, ever. <laughs> and uh, we believe that the road to progress is always under construction. There's never a moment when anyone can actually take your foot off the gas if you really want to be moving forward or keep developing because as soon as we kind of reach a new mile marker, there's that much more road ahead of us. Uh, and I saw a quote by Martin Luther King not too long ago who said, we must accept infinite disappointment, but never lose infinite hope. And this, a lot of people have a lot resting on what's gonna happen on Tuesday. And I think it's important for everyone to think, it doesn't matter what happens on Tuesday, um, because on Wednesday, I still have, and we still have a lot of work to do of um, making ourselves hopefully better and also bringing um, our communities together because there's a lot of divide and conquer strategy that is used to kind of distract us from um, really greater issues. And I think a lot about Audre Lorde, who uh, is an amazing artist, warrior, mother, survivor, lesbian, activist, teacher, who said, uh, there's no such thing as single issue struggles because we do not live single issue lives. Malcolm knew this, Martin knew this. Our struggles are particular, but we're not alone. And to think about, like intersectionality is a term that's been used more frequently, but I think it's really important to, to note that a lot of artists and, and, and critical thinkers have always been working across um, kind of intersectional values and recognize that we all have more things in common than we do that separate us and any deduction of us into a single category can actually take away from our humanity our ability to see um, greater solutions to the challenges that we face and I wanted to ask um, everyone to participate in a small little exercise I like to do with strangers have we met before okay hi I'm Hank can everyone uh, mimic that gesture like shake hands with somebody you don't know. Um, what's your name? Orlando. Orlando, good. Um, so, uh, hey Gina, how are you? So if, 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 if everyone has, how much time do you have? Great, if, uh, so hopefully everyone has, hi Rachel, has a buddy. Um, I saw a, a, a little um, cartoon in a magazine from 1963, Negro Digest, and it was two Af one African-American boy and two white boys on either side of them. And he was standing like this, and it said, the day I discovered I was colored. And it reminded me of the story that my mother told me when she was a young girl about um, the day that her white friends were told that they could no longer play with her because she was a dirty nigger. She didn't know what that meant but she knew obviously that it was very bad and it was scarred her forever. But I think um, all of us, no matter of our ethnicity or our age or gender or cultural background, have that moment that we were othered and that we knew that, that someone else tried to make us feel less than who we are. And I was hoping that everyone could take a moment, we have two minutes, to talk one minute each to the, the person they just met about a moment that they realized that they were other. Ready? Go.
um, where I have that's the first time I've seen it. Really? I'm like, like, really? But I saw this guy down here in the lies. I realized that people were treating him differently. Right. And I had a dream that I had brown hair and blue eyes. <laughs> um, so one more minute. If you switch. Yeah. And I think that is better than I am for some reason. That, the whole well, color and everything. <laughs> well, thanks, Weird Orlando. Experience. Oh, thank you all for. Uh, I hope you uh, learned a little bit something new about yourself and someone else. I just like sharing vulnerable moments with strangers um, and encouraging that. Um, so, I, um, we. It's my turn. It's your turn. You can call the switch if you want. No, we can't. We fought for the right to vote, but still we haven't worn thin. Remember, I'm the one that went from being pepper sprayed and tear gas to being sworn in. I remember needing capital for an office. Now my office is in the capital. Best thing about grassroots, it's all natural. See, they took these laws just to put us behind bars. So I took my Real life bars and store right in the law, so don't get mad at me that I ain't settled for shit. I write bars, I write bills. There's levels to this. What's up, y'all? My name is Bruce Franks Jr. I'm the state representative of the 78 district. I'm not your average state rep, as you can see. <laughs> um, I come from 4,300 gifts. And for those who don't know, it's right down the street. I've been to 178 funerals, most of those funerals being gun violence. First funeral I've ever been to was my brother, Christopher Harris, 1991. He was used as a human shield. Two men came out the house arguing. One pulled out a gun, one picked my brother up, put him in front of him. The reason why I'm here standing in front of y'all as, as one of the speakers on this illustrious panel um, it's because August 9, 2014. August, two, not, August 9, 2014, Michael Brown was murdered. August 9, 2013, my son Akeem was born. And so on August 9, 2014, he was turning one. And I hopped on social media and I saw my brother, Tough Paul, with a picture of a man who said that his son had just been killed by the police. Before that, I wasn't an activist, I wasn't a protester, I didn't consider myself um, in the movement. I was a rapper, I was a businessman, I was just trying to take care of my family. So I didn't really think about those things because those things were normal in my life. Folks being shot by the police, people dying due to gun violence, that was my normal. So once it becomes your normal, you wake up and you think about it five, 10, 15 seconds maybe, and then that's it. But the difference in August 9, 2014 was you could have been in Chicago and heard it happen. Hopped right on the highway, did 80 miles an hour going down 55 and still made it to Ferguson in time to see his body on the ground. And when I got out there, I didn't know why I was out there. I didn't know what, what I was supposed to be doing. I didn't know what I was going. I just thought I needed to go. One of the first faces I saw, we, we greeted each other and after that, 400 days later, we were still out there. When the cameras left, when CNN left, when, when Don Lemon left, <laughs> we were still there. And somebody had this crazy idea, they like, hey, how are you guys gonna affect change? You can protest, you can, you can march, you can organize, you can do all these different things, but what are you gonna do different? So I decided to have this organization. I decided to start working on police community relationship, but on the same hand, still holding police officers accountable. 
Then somebody had an even crazier idea. They was like, hey, how about you run for office? <laughs> Hell no. <nah. laughs> Track is all I'm running. Office. And so they had this idea. They're like, hey, how about you run for a state representative? So I'm like, look, I don't even know what state rep is. I don't know what they're supposed to do. I start knocking on doors around my community. I'm like, hey, do you know who our state representative is? What are some of the things that you want to see out of the state rep? What are some ideas, so on and so forth? The more and more I knock doors, the more and more I realize maybe I should run. So when I decided to run, I had a whole bunch of, no offense to anybody in the room, but I had a whole bunch of old folks, right? A <laughs> whole bunch of older establishment politicians. Most of them look like me. Came to me and said, no, you might not want to run. No, sit back. No, wait your turn. So this is what I've learned. If y'all hear me say anything else or take anything away from anything that I say, remember this, especially my young folks in the room, because I'm talking to y'all. Anytime they tell you to wait your turn, it's probably your turn. <laughs> turn they told me that I couldn't do it I had tattoos on my face I had this rapping background I come from the hood I got a bunch of family members from the hood there's a lot of skeletons right but they forgot the community that I was running it was the same community that I grew up in see I tell people all the time I represent the 78th district it's as far south as Anheuser-Busch and as far north as Crown Candy how many of us love Crown Candy <laughs> right you got Anheuser-Busch you got the arts you have um, Bush Stadium, you have um, all the beautiful buildings downtown, you have um, all these beautiful sites. But that's not why I have the best district in the state of Missouri. I have the best district because I get to represent communities like the Copper, the Peabody, Car Square, Preservation Square, our state streets, piece of the north side, our communities that have $2,200, $22,000 median income, $18,000 median income. These same communities that I grew up in, where my mom had to work at, like Castle right here on Vander Vander and Shoto to, to provide a living for, for my brother and I. That's why I have the best vision, because now I come back to my community, and when I fight, they see somebody that looks like them, that comes from where they come from, that understand the challenges and barriers that they've they've gone through. So when I think about effect and change, now I think about being dangerous. And they're like, how do you just jump to being dangerous? <laughs> because if I could pick an adjective, if I could pick any word that, that, that defines what I do, why I do it, and how I do it, it's dangerous. And I love being dangerous. <laughs> I love every minute of it. Because when we think about the most, pe if you could think about the most peaceful person Right? The most nonviolent person in the civil rights movement, who was it? Somebody say it. Martin Luther King, right? First, first person pop up when you're peaceful, because they tell us, oh, be more like Martin Luther King. We protest, and oh, you should be like Martin Luther King. I told them, well, if that's the case, I only got locked up three times. I need to get locked up 35 more times. So I need to get <laughs> but it's crazy, because in 1968, they considered Martin Luther King the most dangerous man in America. This person who we see is peaceful, nonviolent, the most dangerous man. Why? Because he had the ability to galvanize, right? the ability to bring people together, the ability to, to get stuff done for everybody, not just one particular side of the spectrum. And that's why they consider him that. So those of us who fight for what's right, no matter what level we fight on, the system considers us dangerous. Because when I think about politics, it's like a house, right? And we know what the foundation was built on, if we don't be real, right? We know what it was built on. So when you, when you, when you elect politicians, when you have politicians or, or public service, what I like to call myself, you elect us and our job is to keep up this house. Right? We have all these different positions. Some might come in here and fix the windows, some do a good job on the roof, some do the landscaping. But we keep up this house throughout time. But the one thing we've never touched was the foundation. 
So you can have this big, pretty house that you keep changing the side knows, and the windows and the roof and the, the landscape, but it's still on a shaky foundation. So I feel like I got a new job. I feel like they elected me as the demolition man <laughs> to come tear up the foundation and build it from the bottom so we can have a more inclusive foundation. We like to talk about equity all the time. We like to talk about um, intersectionality, but it's really becoming a buzz for it. Because I can think of a lot of fights that I fought. I can think of a lot of reasons why I've hit the streets, not just for black lives, for every other fight. But then I can count on my hands who was out there when it was a, when it was a, a black body killed by unarmed, killed while being unarmed. I can count on my hands who showed up in our community when we had a mice infestation in our Peabody project. I can show up, I can count on my hands how many of these particular organizational folks showed up in this community when we had 200 plus murders, 188 murders, 188 murders. So while we using this word of intersectionality, while we, while we keep, you know, pinning this phrase, how about, how about we exercise it? Right, how about we truly, truly um, encompass that word and make sure that it becomes part of us. Now I serve in a body where I'm a Democrat. Is that okay to say? <laughs> right, well, if it wasn't, I just said it. <laughs> so I serve in a body where uh, there's 163 of us, uh, 47 of us are Democrat. So in other words, that means we don't even have to show up. <laughs> they still have a quorum, they can do whatever it is they want to do. Um, I have a nickname. I am the Republican Whisperer. <laughs> I'm able to work across the aisle. I'm able to get stuff done by communicating. The number one superpower that we all have in common, that we don't like to utilize, that we overlook, is communication. Because communication has two parts, talking and what's the other. What's the most important? Because we cannot learn if we both talk. I'm able to communicate. Give you a quick example before I close up. I, when I got elected to the floor, when I got elected to the house, one thing that was on my bucket list, with it being predominantly white old men, predominantly conservative folks, I said I cannot wait to get on the microphone during a debate and say Black Lives Matter. I couldn't wait to do it because I wanted to see who was going to squirm in their seat or who was going to stand up. No, all lives matter. I couldn't wait. <laughs> so there was a debate. The debate going on, and I stepped to the mic. And they recognized me, gentlemen, from the 78 district. And I get up there and I say, look, Black Lives Matter. And this is why. So I go into my whole spiel, right? I give it to them. And at the end of it, I say, well, if your rebuttal to Black Lives Matter is all lives matter, then you don't even understand what we're saying. So I have a Republican colleague, Nate Tate. He's from Franklin County. So he's on a conservative radio show. He's, I mean, he's delivering his spiel about what he believes in, so on and so forth. Somebody calls into the radio and says, that Bruce Franks, he's a black, black, uh, black Lives Matter terror. He goes, no, 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 no. Bruce Franks is a pretty good guy. We've been able to work together. We disagree on a lot of things, but we got a lot of respect for each other. He goes, well, don't all lives matter? And Nate said, well, if your rebuttal to black lives matter, it's all lives matter. <laughs> we can change the world with communication. We can change the world, we can change our communities by just listening to each other, just having a real conversation, by understanding that it's okay to have tough, uncomfortable conversations. It's okay to be unapologetic in your stances. It's okay for you to be unapologetically black. It's okay for you to be unapologetic in your stance for black lives. Whatever it is, it's okay to be unapologetic. But just be willing to be uncomfortable, <coughs> respect perspectives, and move to the things that we can work on. 
Appreciate you. So I want to start by uh, acknowledging that the land that we gather on tonight is the ancestral land of the Osage and the Illini people. And I just want to give thanks to their, and to their elders, both past and present. I am a theater major who found herself <laughs> um, in this place where uh, I am looked to, to talk about racial equity one of the buzzwords that we, we do well here in St. Louis, um, and generally navigate waters of race and class and otherness uh, in a way that I never could have imagined as a five-year-old who said when she wanted to grow up, she wanted to wear a suit and work for Disney. Um, I came to this work uh, by way of the Ferguson Commission, which was appointed by the governor in the wake of the unrest that these folks here uh, were key in keeping going following the killing of Mike Brown. And the commission was, char was charged with coming up with policy recommendations to address the root causes that had come to light in the wake of the uprising. And while it was named for the commission, while it was named for Ferguson, it was clear that the things that we were looking at and we were addressing and that the things that people were calling to light were issues around not just the St. Louis region, but the entire country. Uh, I often like to help people see that if you looked at a lot of the statistics and inequities that exist in Ferguson, that there are many, many more places in our region where those inequities and statistics are a lot worse. Ferguson is everywhere. And when I was first asked to consider working for the commission, um, my first answer was no. I'm not gonna touch that with a 500 foot pole. The governor's just doing this to have done something, and these things matter too much to me and people who look like me for me to be part of that charade. Um, but I never say no to a conversation, so communication. Uh, and so I went and met with the managing director, Bethany johnson Javois, and she basically said, they think this is a show. They think they are just gonna have us, you know, have some meetings and move some stuff around, but I'm here to get some stuff done and I need your help. And I didn't feel like I could say no to that. So I came to this work um, not as an activist. Um, I grew up in the suburbs across the river in Illinois, um, middle, upper middle class. These things have always mattered to me, but I had never been called to take the deep dive that the last three and a half years have sent me on. And I am very clear, more clear every day, the privileges that I have had that allow me to have the titles, like the one that I was introduced <laughs> with. Some of you saw me uh, chuckle at that. Um, and the opportunities that I've had through doing this work. And so showing up to this work clear and clearer every day about the privileges that I have, working with folks like Bruce, working with folks like Tef and many others, um, have really caused me to think deeply about how we honor all parts of the work. How we bring ourselves, our baggage, our otherness, our sameness, um, our shame, our guilt, and figure out how to put it into the work in order to get the work done. In the process of the commission, I think it was the perfect um, kind of vehicle for a lot of this tension. I think it was far from perfect, and I think a lot of people thought it was far from perfect, and people will tell you to this day that it wasn't, but it held the closest thing to a chance to be institutionally recognized for the pain and the inequity and the hurt and the trauma that people were going to get. And I still feel till this day that this work of tying government and institutions and policy and buzzwords like racial equity to the real lives people live every day with mice infestation and subpar education opportunities and subpar work opportunities, it, was, it, it existed almost in spite of itself because we don't often see 
the way in which those things have to coexist together in order to get us somewhere different. And Bruce talked about the foundation and when you learn about, deeply learn about the policies, the history, the ways in which the country we live in was built, it's so clear that in order to get somewhere different, we're both gonna have to use some of those tools and completely eradicate a lot of them. And so riding that line between knowing that to get something done today, you have to work within something that is inherently flawed is not easy work. And it takes all of us stretching, I think, a lot um, what we want and how we want it to happen and allowing pieces of the work to get done by the people who can do those parts of the work, tagging out and tagging other folks in. And to have folks who can use their gifts of art, their gifts of communication, their gifts of politicking to help us see those paths, I think is critically important and something that I feel like we're just scratching on here in St. Louis. Something that has been clear in the work that's happened since the killing of Mike Brown is that there's always been a cry that the arts need to be at the table. The arts were not at the table in a core way for the Ferguson Commission. The arts haven't been at the table in some of the institutional um, systemic interventions that have, that have started, initiatives that have started to come up. But I keep it keeps being clear that we need that artistic leadership to be able to help us see something different. If we don't have a vision of where we wanna be, if we don't have those visions painted, then we can't relax into the very uncomfortable, very messy space that we have to live in in order to get there. And so I, I am hopeful, um, it's, it's tough because you know that you've got real, day-to-day -day challenges for people. And we also know that dismantling this house and rebuilding a new one is gonna take time. And to hold the tension between the very needed voices of now, now is too late, years ago we need to change these things, and the reality of what it takes to change them is, is tough. And so having the arts have a place there is critical for us to figure out, I think, as, as St. Louis, as a region. And so I encourage everybody who has shown up and who continues to show up and who continues to explore this question to continue to push. Like, it's really clear that I wouldn't have been in the positions that I've been in and have the position I have now if folks like Bruce and Teff hadn't stayed out on the street. It is clear that there's a number of things happening in this region right now that wouldn't be happening if people hadn't continued to push. So understand that whether you are in the street or you're in a boardroom or you're in a committee meeting, that speaking up and speaking out and pushing to push the envelope, pushing to ask for whom is this and who is benefiting from this, that is moving us somewhere. And so keep it up. So I'm not entirely a stranger to the microphone, but I am a stranger to speaking in front of people. A lot of my speaking is just to a microphone in a box. So um, when I was asked to participate in this, uh, kind of started thinking about the, the freedom of speech. That is one of the four freedoms and one of the freedoms that these artists and, and workers and thinkers up here use to communicate their ideas. And the, um, the, the old superhero canard with great power comes great responsibility started kind of kicking around in my head a little bit. My profession as a journalist is constitutionally protected. Congress shall make no law abridging freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of assembly, freedom of the press. There's, I don't think, a single other profession specifically written into the Constitution. Maybe perhaps alcohol distributors with the elimination of prohibition, but specifically no other profession, no other job is mentioned in the Constitution. And that's where great, that's incredible power. The press has done incredible things. We've brought down presidents, we've brought down governors, whether you like how it happened or not, we brought down governors. We've brought down Hollywood producers. There is incredible power there. 
and we give incredible power to everyone who is in this room. Information is power, whether it's as simple as knowing not to go down that street because there's a traffic jam and you have to be on your way. And it is, is as complex as debating these ideas as letting the people know that Teff and Bruce and everyone are still out on the streets, showing and telling their stories. But there is an immense responsibility that also comes with that great power. And it is on all of us as press and on those who get the information, who get, who get the information that we give. Sam Sanders last week, I don't know how many of you guys listened to his um, uh, It's Been a Minute show or podcast. He always has a segment called Three Words. And his three words last week were speaking of the press, are we lying? And it had a lot to do with how in fact checking the president, you're putting his idea out into the public by saying who is claiming falsely that there are Middle Eastern terrorists in the migrant caravan coming up through Mexico. CNN airing his rallies nonstop during the presidential campaign. I think the press does have to take some responsibility for allowing Donald Trump to be elevated to that position not pushing, exploring, looking, calling him out. If you want to see someone who I think does it really well, Daniel Dale, who is with the Toronto Star, I believe. He covers uh, DC and the president for the Toronto Star. Um, I think he is D Dale 8 on Twitter, but don't quote me on that one, but it is definitely Daniel Dale with one of the Toronto papers. Um, I think he's Globe and Mail. I think he's Toronto Globe and Mail. And he will follow a, a Trump speech and fact check in the tweet. Trump falsely claims this. Trump falsely claims that. I think it's the most responsible way I've seen it happen. And we have to be responsible in, in how we talk, the words we use for uh, communities, respecting people's pronouns, respecting who they are. That is our responsibility because we've been given the power in the Constitution to be free. But as news consumers, I think you guys also have a responsibility as well. Talked about communicating, hearing other ideas not telling you to go necessarily watch Fox News, but read news outlets that you may disagree with philosophically, but are raising and discussing the issues. The left and the right are both prone to confirmation bias. We, you know, we're reading things and it confirms what we already believe, so we believe that therefore it's true. No, not necessarily. Go look, find different perspectives. Being informed is helpful when you vote. You know what is on the ballot. You know how it's going to affect it. It lets you think about it. Uh, it is an incredible power to have a constitutionally protected right and a constitutionally protected profession. And it is incredible power for you guys to have the information that is at your fingertips from all sources, from the phones that you know, we all have. And I, I go back to that canard. With great power comes incredible responsibility. And I hope that all of us in this room kind of keep that in mind as we go on Tuesday and ahead. I'm like some mega extrovert, but I'm really not. So, um, <laughs> so if you see me like in public most times and I walk by you very awkwardly, it's not because I'm being weird, it's just that I'm straight up a self-contained person. <laughs> uh, but I've been put into a lot of positions in life that forced me to be outward going. Yo, big respect. You are my favorite people in this community. <laughs> Ferguson and it was one of the days where the police had really tear gassed us really bad and I went home and I sat in my lived in my room in my house and at that time my, my, my home was in a complete state of disarray. I had people from the movement in and out of my crib. Some folks had just moved into my crib were living in my living room. It became like a crash crib for people that were in the streets and uh, with that came an energy of chaos because my, my address I got put on the internet by the police. Folks were driving by my house. It was just the craziest situation I could imagine myself being in. So I sat in my living room, and uh, I sat in my bedroom, and I, and I looked at the floor, and I just sat there, and I was kind of in the fetal position on the floor, and I was rocking back and forth, 
And I said, damn, I did it. In America, as a black man, you got very limited options. My options <coughs> may be to luck up and become a fucking rapper. Ding, ding, ding. Um, <laughs> maybe I'll go to the NBA or some shit. College, yeah, right. Uh, but there's also a pipeline path to prison. How am I going to end up in prison? Am I going to sell drugs? Uh, am I going to become some crazy black radical that the government calls a terrorist? Ding, ding, ding. <laughs> so I sat there and I said, damn, I'm filling these boxes. And I said, OK, so what, what, what fate does this bestow for me? Like, what, what, what becomes of this? Because the, the most brilliant men and women that we've seen from our heritage have not defeated the American government. There has been a revolution, there was a revolution in the 60s uh, where a coalition of forces came together to, to spark a cultural revolution and a political revolution and a social revolution. And when you talk to a lot of the old Black Panthers, they say, well, the revolution we started got defeated. And I sat there and I said, well, damn, we're nowhere near sophisticated as these folks. Um, they put bullets in all the brightest minds that we had, uh, or they forced them into exile. And here we are in a very similar position against basically the same exact regime with more guns, more money, more bombs, and a bigger appetite for death and destruction. So I, I just looked at this whole playing field and said, it's cute, it looks good for CNN, but we getting our asses kicked. So <clears throat> I had to make a decision, like how, how deep of a role did I want to play in that? What was going to become of the life that I once lived? Because I lived a very normal life, even though I was politically active. Uh, I didn't consider myself an activist, and I still don't consider myself an activist. And I actually hate the terminology activist. Um, I am a person who lives in a country that dropped two atomic bombs on Japan. I am a person who uh, lives in a country that believes in seizing land by way of uh, forcing people of color and indigenous folks into a, a colonial state of existence. I am a person, I am a member of, I am a citizen of a country that is treated uh, the LGBTQ community like absolute trash, like absolute shit. I am a, a, a member of, a, a citizen of a country that believes that what's happening to black folks in the ghetto is not genocide. Uh, I am a citizen of a country where my mother could not drink out of the same water fountains as white people. The FBI had to take my grandmother to work every day. She was the first black woman to segregate uh, factories in this city. I am a, uh, a citizen of a country that tells the rest of the world one thing, but, but the receipts for me produce a totally different reality. So for me, that's not activism. That's common goddamn sense. To, to, to wake up and say, hey, I got to do something about this. Because guess what? You're going to die anyway. Your chances of going to jail, they're already high. That's already on the table. How you're going to go is, is the question. Going is not, we'll do that. We'll go to jail. That's, that's, hotel, that's hotel to run. So <clears throat> I found myself in this position, and these things started morphing. And, and, in my reality, even though I thought I was politicized, things started to change for me and, and, and shift inside of me, and I started to learn about things that I really didn't know that I would end up learning about in life at a certain point. Um, and up until that point, I considered myself an artist uh, that played his role. I registered folks to vote when I could. Uh, if I had a job, my job would be rooted in doing something politically in the community, uh, but I never, 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 never in a million years thought that I would be as involved as I became involved in something like the Ferguson Uprising. Um, and I think that's important to note because in this society, even though we all know that we are fighting an engrossing war machine, we all know that mass incarceration is running rapid. We all know that it's cool for certain people to live and it's all right for certain people to die. Most of us, quite frankly, don't do a damn thing about it, and we're comfortable with that. We want to donate five dollars to the Obama campaign while Gray Anatomy, Gray's Anatomy is on, <laughs> click our toes in our onesie, and that's enough. See you see you at work tomorrow. <laughs> the responsibility of actually doing something about it is dished off to Bruce Friends, dished off to these women right here. 
dished off to whoever else. You know, like it, it just isn't your responsibility. It's not something that you have to wear because we live in a society where most of us have the privilege of, of assuming that someone else is doing something about this stuff. So I'm a person that said I can't make the assumption that somebody's doing something about it because guess what? Those tanks are 15 minutes from my mom's house. Uh, Ferguson is not South Africa. A lot of folks in St. Louis could have drove right there, put their bodies on the line with a lot of us. They did not do it. So I found myself in a very frustrated position, not just with the police, not just with the folks that are racist, but also with the freaking liberals that uh, the first word out of their mouths when we showed up at the police station the next day that Mike Brown was murdered, said, looking for answers was, did y'all vote? So, um, as an artist, I said, what is my role in all of this? I had to weaponize my art. And I had to make art that I felt uh, spoke to the sign of the times. Art that I felt, you know, 60, 30, 30 to 60 years from now when I'm old and gray and I can't walk, and this art is all that's left to show what my identity was about. Uh, how did that art contribute to the historical narrative of that time? So when you listen back to my music in 2014, you won't hear me rapping about people twerking and shaking their ass. You won't hear me rapping about the fact that I had to inhale tear gas from a military regime which occupied a neighborhood that I grew up in. And I'm very big on language because all too often, we give society these cubby holes to escape through the language we use. Um, the language is, oh, so, so, so fuck Trump is, is the catchphrase of everybody today. But a lot of us lived in Trump's America before there was any type of notion that Donald Trump would be the president. So <clears throat> that's why when you go to the hood, folks, and you talk to folks about voting, they're like, nah, why would I vote? This shit already looks like hate. And that's no offense to hate, but it already looks like somebody came here, bulldozed the house, took a piss on the front steps, and said, sign off. What are you talking about, vote? So as an artist, it's my job to give you the emotion that I feel that is attached to these things. Uh, it's my job to. Uh, make some type of content, even if, and I'm not like this super political rapper like people try to make me out to be. They try to make me out to be like this ice cube, like, hey, the system, we did it, did it. Like, nah, man, I smoke weed, I watch Netflix. <laughs> you know, like, you know, I'm a regular person. But I'm a, I'm a person that has opinions, I'm a person that has an analysis, and I'm a person that is, uh, I just happen to be in the position to where my analysis is heard by more people than the average person's analysis. So that gives me an extra responsibility to sharpen my analysis and to, to use that to shift the needle wherever I can, to be uh, not an ally, I hate the word ally, to be a co-conspirator of women's rights, uh, to be a co-conspirator of poor people's rights, uh, to be a co-conspirator co uh, to the Jewish community, uh, as they are under attack, as anti-Semitism rises, to be a co-conspirator to the Palestinian community as we don't address what's going on in the war-torn countries, <coughs> such as Palestine sometimes. So, <clears throat> when I look at Ferguson, I, I, I met a, a bunch of people from South Africa, and they said, we've been waiting for y'all. And I said, what do you mean by that? He said, we've been waiting for black Americans to wake the hell up, to, to join the oppression party, to, to when, we, when they saw photos of kids from the ghetto throwing back tear gas canisters with, with, with do-rags wrapped around their face, they said, well, goddamn, maybe they didn't drink the juice. Maybe they did snap out of it. Maybe, just maybe, there's some hope for Americans. So uh, I know that my vision of this country to some folks is a very dismal and a very uh, depressed vision. But, it, but I've had to make beauty of this depression. I've had to beautify the fact that uh, I can walk outside right now and be gunned down, and, and not only by the police. And I'm not a part of the 
while police brutality is an immense problem, it's a large problem, it's a huge problem, it's one of the greatest problems we have right now, but I'm also in the middle of this situation where the guns from the police can gun me down and the guns from uh, people in my community that have been weaponized against me can gun me down. So I have two enemies that I gotta face. And similar to how Bruce was talking about the intersections, this is where the intellectuals and the politicals of today can't give you the analysis of both of those worlds merging because quite frankly, they're talking about predatory policing when they ain't never been beat up by the police. They're talking about violence in the hood when they ain't never even seen a goddamn gun. They're talking about gun control for black Americans as if it's just as easy for me as a black man to go get a gun as it is for a white man. So <clears throat> the narratives are sometimes that off balance and, and I'm seeing the development right now of what we call a new radical left black bourgeoisie in America that has the greatest race analysis but the most minimalistic class analysis. And I don't want to be a part of that regime. But by proxy of my identity, by proxy of location, I can't erase the fact that I've been at Harvard for two years. I can't erase the fact that uh, I use six letter words. I can't erase the fact that I'm not a fellow. So by proxy of my identity, I'm a part of that, whether I want to be a part of that or not. So I have a responsibility to be Jesus in that place. I have a responsibility to flip over the tables and tell them, today, I'm not cool with what y'all talking about. Uh, because the, the folks that look like me, the, folk, the other cats that got the gold teeth and the tattoos, they're not going to get the opportunity to come in here and say that because they're not going to use the words right, their pants going to sag, they might not smell good, they might not look good, they are intimidated. White America loves the lion that they can pet on the head and go back home and say, God damn, that motherfucker could have bit my head off. So, in my art, you, 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 you see me mixing all these things up. Well, I don't want to always be angry. And, I, and we, a lot of us were challenged, you know, being rappers. They were like, yo, are y'all finessing the movement for a platform? My platform is on Aftalon and Redbud in the midst of a goddamn gang war where you don't know shit about that. I got to go home to that after I do CNN. When I come home from Harvard, usually my first question is, is my gun within proximity of this vehicle because we live in a city that has one of the highest murder rates. And quite frankly, I am in fear of my life. My life. Friends of mine, dead, gone, can't come back. Death, you can't retract death. Once it's over, it's over. So I'm making art that tells you about these different narratives. And what I don't want it to be is tokenized this, this uh, trip to the zoo for folks. This, this urban safari for folks. I want you to feel the emotion that I feel. I want you to understand that these narratives, uh, even though for the sake of me showing you how brutal they are, yes, there is a pinch of exaggeration. But that's the same thing that Hillary and Donald Trump and Bernie do. They exaggerate the circumstances for the sake of their agenda. So I'm, I'm exaggerating the circumstances also on a very minimalistic level to show you that there are complicated narratives in all of this stuff, and this is just mine. And I have a constituency just like Bruce does, even though I'm not an elected official. And I have to answer to that constituency. Great. We're gonna we're gonna fl turn to the part of the evening where we um, ask you to participate by asking questions, making comments, um, or any observations you'd like. Please uh, come and step up to the mic, um, and feel free to line up at the mic, and we'll just kind of go for a little while, and I'll let you know when we start running out of time. Hi there, my name is Janie. Um, I'm a visual, visual art grad student at WashU. Um, my work seeks to document Florida's queer history as a response to climate change before rising sea levels wash it all away. 
Um, I was wondering, how do you get people to care about an issue if they can't physically touch or see the thing that's happening? How do you motivate people to make changes and put forth effort if they might not directly benefit from those efforts? Thank you. So, um, first off, that's a really good question. That's something that I had to learn. Um, like it, with environmental issues, I'm from the hood, right? So we're not tripping off global warming or nothing else, um, simply because we got a whole bunch of other shit to worry about, right? Um, but once I got into the house, I understood the more and more folks, like the environmental activists that came and talked to me, like I wouldn't listen to the lobbyists, I wouldn't listen to the other uh, elected official, but the environmental activists that put their life on the line and that felt like these are the issues, like I connected with them. And so when you, in my personal opinion, um, when you're trying to talk to somebody about something that they might not be interested in, um, you have to be able to articulate it in a way and they have to be able to feel it coming from you, um, whether it's personal story, passion, whatever it is. Uh, quick example, I had a gentleman in the House, a Republican, um, who said, you know what, I can't, I can't really feel where you're coming from. Um, I, I don't understand it because I'm not black. So I don't have to go through what you went through. I said, okay, well, um, you got kids? He said, yeah. I said, were you there when they were born? He said, absolutely. I said, so when your wife was having a child, was she in pain? And he said, yeah. I said, she couldn't have been. And he said, how are you going to tell me? I was there. I said, well, how did you know she was in pain? He was like, well, um, I saw it. I heard her cries. You know, I could just feel it. I said, but you didn't have to go through nine months of labor and you didn't have to go through contractions or actually have the baby. He said, oh, all you got to do is listen. So if you articulate it the right way, um, if you deliver that message the right way, they'll feel where you're coming from. Um, and that's, that's the first step in it. Use the art to make people think and to understand and to ask questions. And um, as was said earlier, oh, I don't get it. Well, work to understand it. I think also um, connecting the dots because something like that absolutely does impact all of us. And so any way that you can connect the dots to where people are is in, can be impactful. Hey, everybody. Hi. What's up, Justin? <laughs> hey. Um, First and foremost, I'd like to say thank y'all for being here. Second, I'd like to say thank y'all again for bringing pain into change, which our voices, our talents, and things of that nature. And my thing is, how can everyone here lead tonight with some type of action to create change? Because as Bruce talked about equity, everybody in this room, we may not look the same, we're not in the same lane, but we all here for one reason, and that's to create change. So I ask you all, what can we do as a region to help create the change that we need to see so we don't be a part of um, Cole's Night T-shirt up there the Missouri Compromise? <laughs> uh, I'm always I'm down. You got it? I was going to say first, we got an election November 6th, yep. so you can go vote. And uh, here's the thing about voting. We, it's, it's, you have to vote. Like, you just got to go vote. So, but the thing is, a lot of people stop their political engagement with just voting. So they go vote, and they go, cool. Claire McCaskill sucks, we, we thought she was gonna do this. It's like, no, you can't put the world on Claire. Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, you still have a civic duty to participate in the environment that you live in. So, so voting is one thing, and I like to look at it like, the same way that we have to weaponize our art to be, uh, used to, to spark critical thought and to, cre and to create nuanced arguments and things like that, uh, that's what your vote is. Your vote is essentially uh, a, something that you should weaponize to, to create dialogue, to uh, spark change, you know, just spark it. It's not gonna, you can't rest the world on uh, the shoulders of Barack Obama or the next Democratic nominee for president. So um, a lot of that resides in you and, and how you navigate outside of voting. So, what he said, um, voting is important. That sounds cliche as hell, right? But um, I get to go into the communities that look like me, that have historically felt disenfranchised with the political process and say, hey, how many of you think voting is rigged? 
and almost everybody always raises their hand. And I say, well, if it was rigged, I wouldn't be here because I'm the last person that they want in office, right? And so to be able to articulate that and give them example, but outside of that, being able to explain why it's important to vote even when you don't necessarily have two candidates that you believe in, right? I'm a Hamilton fan, right? I know, I know you are too, me and Nicole uh, but So I'm a Hamilton fan, right? And so I learned more about Alexander Hamilton and that entire period from the play than I ever learned at school, and I went to a great school. Um, but one important part was when it was up to Alexander Hamilton to pick who would be um, basically like the next president, right? He had a choice um, between Aaron Burr and he had a choice between Thomas Jefferson. Aaron Burr was his friend at one point. They did stuff together. Thomas Jefferson, he fought like hell every time. And he picked Thomas Jefferson. And the reason he picked Thomas Jefferson because Thomas Jefferson actually stood on something. Right? He had these particular values. We might not agree with those values, whatever, but he picked this person. This person that had no, no nothing, who was just trying to climb up a ladder, that sounds like a guy that's running for Senate right now, um, he, he didn't pick him. And I'm pretty sure he would have rather had somebody else. You know, I rather, he'd rather it be him. But he had to make a choice. And that's one thing that I had to learn. Um, it's, it's not about that, because I was the biggest burn, I was one of the biggest burning pre people out here. I introduced him at SIU. I mean, I was down, right? And then when he lost, I was like, oh yeah, I'm voting for her, right? It, it didn't even cross my mind to do anything else. Because voting is like driving. Uh, my mom say, you can be the best driver on earth, but if you don't watch for the other cars, if you don't pay attention to the others driving around you, um, then how good really is your driving? And it's just like voting. I'm, I'm going to make a decision for those other folks in my community and outside of my community, right? I'm going to make the best informed decision for them. You know, and so the folks that decide to sit out, I tell them, like, you now when you say you don't do politics, don't worry about it because politics will do you regardless. Right, so. So Tuff mentioned an analysis, and I was glad you were the first person to mention that. It wasn't me with the buzzwords. Um, but the idea of having a good understanding of how this system actually works, and having a good understanding of how this house has been built, I guarantee you can learn more about that. And having a voracious obsession with deeply understanding how we got here, what it means for us to be where we are, is critical to us getting something different. And I guarantee if you dig deeper on learning about how we got here, it'll show you a bunch of ways that there are things working that you cannot see. And then you'll see them and you'll know where to work. I, I can't add anything that hasn't been said other than to kind of echo, I'm not even sure that's on. So I'm not going to worry about it because I can be loud enough. Um, to echo what Nicole said, be informed, vote, learn, see, and then figure out the ways within your community that you can pull the levers that you learn to see. Hi, my name is Terry Riley. I'm a professor at Webster University, and I'm grateful for your time here. Um, I want to share with you um, in my upper level, my senior level social movements class, uh, my class participated in the Four Freedoms Project by going out and talking to their classmates about it and then uh, put the posters up around campus. But I really want to talk with you about my freshman class. Um, and they were born in 2000. And I don't know, <laughs> and it's like real hard for some of the 2000. It's like, Jeez, you know, and some of you are really young, but that might make you feel old. Um, and, and as an aside, I, I do really strongly believe that teachers can be co-conspirators. Public school teachers, not so much. But here's where um, I find the debate going on right now with these Gen Zs and millennials. Um, they've certainly come down on the side of the First Amendment. You ask them, freedom of expression. You know, the complexity of the media is a little more challenging for freshmen. But they also then say, um, but people don't necessarily have the right to say what they want. 
So there is this dichotomy going on between, if you, if you look at the research now on young people, it's like, yeah, there's this important thing called freedom of expression, and we have this First Amendment thing, but we're more concerned about, on a very basic, simple level, not hurting anybody. Okay, but on a more, you know, higher level, it's like, do you really have the right to say that? And, and so I, I really f struggle with that, you know, coming from you know, us older people, us old, older ones in the audience, season <laughs> one. You know, I mean, we grew up, and that was so sacrosanct, and that now they're like, that's not necessarily all that important to me, that I would rather, um, you know, pe people be protected and like, people not really able to say what they want. So communication is key. Where do we go with that kind of... And it is, a, it is a problem because they look at social media. Where do we go with that? That is, uh, you know, I don't think that's, I think it's precipitated by Trump, definitely. But I also think that's something we need to think about for the future of our country. If young people are saying, you maybe not have the right to say what you want to say. So how do then we get, communicate and get the word out? Thank you for your time. I think there's two kind of things to consider in there. Having the right to say something is one thing. Freedom from consequences is an entirely different thing. I can, you know, go on air, shoot my mouth off, whatever, I have the right to do that. It probably will not stop my news director from calling me in the next day and being like, guess what, you no longer have a job. That's something that, you know, you have to make the decision of, if I say this, am I willing to accept the consequences of it? And secondly, I think there is a difference between the right to say something, maybe the right to use certain words, and whether it is appropriate for you to do it. Do I think that anyone can legally use the N-word? Yes. Do I think that it is appropriate, right, correct for it to be used in all spaces? Absolutely not. And that's also an important distinction to make. If somebody you know, wants to, to use it, they have the right to do that. But they don't have freedom from the consequences for it, and you may not necessarily think that it's appropriate. So I think helping in some way your students understand the difference between what is legal, what is protected, and maybe what isn't appropriate, and then also understanding that um, listening, speaking, hearing ideas are about being uncomfortable. And it doesn't, it, uh, abusive is different from being uncomfortable. Abusive, hate speech, whatever, that's not protected. There's been court rulings on that. But things that you may disagree with are absolutely protected and you absolutely, to be a good citizen and to understand and to learn, have to hear those things that make you uncomfortable. I think we've gotten that confused that, you know, disagreement is a bad thing. No, it's not, get in there, get uncomfortable, you know? like. And the media has this habit of being like, oh, well, there's two sides to some, there's not two sides to some stuff. <laughs> there's not two sides, you know, to Charlottesville, there's not two sides to climate change. There are things that people can intellectually disagree on. But yeah, hopefully that helps. So really, um, that's perfect um, to, to kind of piggyback off that, um, like when you talk about the consequences, right? Like, and I'm glad the N-word was brought up because that's one conversation that we kind of had. And that's what I said. I said, well, you can use it. Um, just don't be surprised if I punch you in the mouth, right? <laughs> um, but it, it's, it's well within your right to use it, right? And, and if you're willing to accept those consequences that come with it, whatever, that's fine. Um, one thing, though, is serving in the body that I serve in. Um, I, I serve with a lot of rural area um, guys and gals who um, they grew up in their community. Everybody in their community looked like them. They've talked the same way for the last couple hundred years, how many of it they've been there. Um, and that's just what their normal is, right? So this, this young black dude with tattoos on his face from the city shows up, and now we got the same job, and now they got the opportunity to have a conversation. They got the opportunity to ask some questions that they've only been seeing on the news and only been seeing on, on well, they don't watch CNN, but Fox News, right? Um, and so I'm willing, bless you, I'm willing to have those conversations. And a lot of those conversations, I start off like, this mother. <laughs> but I take a step back and realize that, you know what, some of them, I'll, I'll honestly say it, 
some of them don't truly understand what they're saying is it's as offensive as it's coming off, right? So I give you that opportunity to be like, hey, that's wrong, and let me tell you why. And if you say it again, we're going to have a problem. But you got to be willing, like, like Rachel said, you got to be willing to be uncomfortable and have these conversations. Um, and it goes, it, it's rough. It's rough, especially for me, because Tef knows me, so I haven't always been this, this person that I am today. So you take a step back and you listen to everybody, but yeah, I agree with what Rachel said. And I will add, too, in, in sort of Bruce's defense is maybe the wrong word, it is not always on the responsibility of the communities who you may be offending to teach you why it may be offensive. Get out there and, you know, there are resources out there. You can ask for resources to learn. I'm sure Ferguson Commission put together reading lists. I've seen reading lists on a whole bunch of different topics. If you're curious, go learn. It is not always on Bruce and on other members of marginalized communities to explain why things may be offensive to you. If you're curious about something and want resources and are approaching it genuinely, they're more than happy to help. But if you're approaching it like, well, you have to explain to me why X, Y, and Z are blah, blah, blah. It's like, no, man, pick up a book or, you know, get on a Kindle or Google. <laughs> I'm going to use that. Uh, so I feel as if uh, it's weird because I, I, I just feel like nothing is a dichotomy. And, and sometimes uh, I've heard people critique me and say, well, you kind of operate like a politician. One day you feel this way. One day you feel that way. Well, I'm operating like a human. Yeah. So um, what I feel about this moment right here is that uh, consequences are definitely necessary. 300, 3,000, 3 trillion percent, if you're going to speak it, there should be consequences if it's something that's inflammatory or just dangerous to say or offensive to say. Uh, but with that being said, we do need people on both sides of the fence, because these are folks' reality. My reality is that I'm against white supremacy, and it's another person's reality that white supremacy is going to preserve their culture and foster everything that they believe in into a wonderful, beautiful blossoming. I'm a part of the counter-narrative. I'm a part of the counter-reality. I'm a part of the insurgents that are unfortunately in a very combative moment against their beliefs. Um, th their beliefs represent the demise of me physically and sometimes intellectually. But what, where I feel we're moving in this country is uh, we are not forcing conservatives to have intellectual arguments. So when Megyn Kelly says something stupid on TV, I don't necessarily know that I want you to fire her. I want you to bring an intellectual with a counter opinion and a counter a narrative on television for the rest of the country who just saw her say this crazy insane stuff to rebuttal and be able to present a logic show the world what a logical person that does not believe in what she just said looks like so all too often we get left with these folks it's like coming to a, a house party and you get jumped by somebody and then your boys pull you out the party right before you can no don't pull me out the party let's fight them motherfuckers back so if I get hit and I go home without getting my hit back, I'm going to be pretty pissed off. So I see a lot of that going on, and it bothers me because they don't have a leg to stand on, but then we boost them up as if they're just these intellectually sound people that have the, they, they cannot go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the brightest logical minds in the country right now. And I would love to see more of that actually happening versus she's going to get paid, she's going to get her severance. I saw today, like I read an article today, she's getting like 38 million. Man, I wish I could get 38 million for saying what's wrong with blackface. Like, I, I say that shit every day. I just want million as a reporter, man. <laughs> Come on. Like, think about what they could have put into reporting and debating and considering with $38 million. I will never see $38 million in my lifetime. We did not win the Powerball. We did not win the Mega Millions. <laughs> I'm just going to I'm just going to um interrupt for just one second and say just cuz I'm I'm in charge of managing time so this these will be our last three comments and questions. Thank you. Hello. Hello. You know as I've been listening and and I've been watching and listening to many of you for years and years and part of this community just like you. Um your caretakers, your elders, you're holding so closely to the people that you love and the place that you love, and it's an immense, immense responsibility. I can't look at you or I'll cry, stop it. 
Um, and I've been thinking, you know, since Mike Brown was killed especially, what does it look like for institutions like mine? I run an art space called The Luminary. What does it look like for us to push and be caretakers? What does it look like to punch up and also care so well for our communities where we can? I was talking with somebody about this term caretaker. I changed my title a couple of years ago because director just wasn't suitable for me. I wasn't interested in that. I was interested in being present with the people who I serve. And I appreciated you saying, I have a constituency too. That was so beautiful. I was talking to someone about this, this title, caretaker, and why I'm, I did that was, it was language I could live into. I could hold myself up to that, you know? And um, they said, you know, artists are the caretakers of the public imaginary. And that has sat with me so heavy in the most beautiful way that it's our job not just to be mirrors and reflections of what's going on and make that more apparent to folks, but it's to like dream and find a way that we can like get there. And I'm curious from all of you, um, do you feel like the institutions, my institution in the city, are we doing that enough? Are we, are we doing what you do? Are we even getting close to risking ourselves enough and being open to critique? Are we being bold enough? Are we calling it knowing that we might lose some of our donors or supporters? Are we, are we doing that well? What do you want to see from us? What do you want to see from Art Spaces in St. Louis? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think there are a lot of people pushing harder than they've ever pushed or institutions pushing harder than they've ever pushed and much harder than they're comfortable. I also think that we are 500 years into this American experience, experiment, and uh, the stakes are high. And so I think that we have done some things and done not enough long enough that what we are called to do right now is way much more uncomfortable than any of us can probably even imagine. To really make a difference, to really turn the tide on this 500 years the things that we are called to do and how deep we are called to, to dig is outside of language I can even come up with to describe it. Um, so that is to say that there are some great moments that I see come across my feed or hear about that I'm like, whoa, that institution is doing that? They invited in who? Oh, watch you hired me after knowing exactly who they were hiring? Um, as much as I see that, I think all of us, even those who have done those things, have to, have to dig deeper and have to push harder, and have to get much, much, much more uncomfortable. Yes, what you said. Um, to answer the question, no. There are some that are doing as much as they can do. Um, I work my ass off. Tef works his ass off, so does Rachel, so does Nicole, so does this brother here. Um, at the end of the day, we all still feel like we could be doing more. Correct me if I'm wrong. And I look at, um, one thing you said that stuck out is when you have these institutions that are in fear of losing funding or in fear of losing a, you know, a donor or a support or Martin Luther King said, there comes a time when you do something not because it's popular, not because it's safe, um, not because it's political, but because your conscience tells you it's right, right? And so what I try to tell folks is I understand that we have to keep these institutions going, um, but being safe doesn't save black lives. Right, being safe in your own particular realm, whatever it is, taking a step back saying, well, no, I'm not gonna do this because it might upset these folks. But we might need you to make that step, right? To make that statement to a broader audience that says, you know what, I stand with Black Lives too, or I stand with whatever particular community that you wanna fight for, or you know what, I stand with everybody. Right, and we, we need folks to get out there in the forefront and be more unapologetic in their stances. And that's where, when I was talking earlier, when I talked about being dangerous, you know, part of being dangerous is being willing to be unsafe, right? Like, because we put ourselves in unsafe situations all the time. 
uh, as a state representative, I can remember last year that I'm pretty sure I was getting out of jail from doing something for, for protesting last year or blocking a highway or standing in front of militarized police or being in a community where I mentor and I got to go save a youth from a gunfight or a dice game where they feel like they're going to get robbed. And this is in my capacity now as an elected official. So what I need for the institutions to do is I'm not asking you to go out there and hop in the middle of a gunfight. I'm not saying get out there and block the highways with me. What I'm saying is whatever it is in your particular realm, do that version of blocking the highway, right? Do that version of getting in, in front of a bullet. Do, do whatever it is you can do to be unsafe and dangerous to show the other folks in your particular realm or your institutions or your your it's not business as usual we're not going back to that um and, and we just need we just need more folks to stand and be unapologetic in their stances the safe shit ain't gonna get us nowhere i'll add one thing i wonder if you'd be surprised at you know, one falls, one donor steps out, three, four, five more come in because you were willing to take that risk. And I love the, I love the luminary. It's in my district. They do, they do some great work and open their doors and I appreciate y'all. Uh, I guess uh, I was at this Halloween party uh, last weekend, uh, hosted by this artist from St. Louis named Sir Irwin uh, I forgot his last name because it's Erwin Williams. Yeah, he's an actor. He's a poet. Uh, just all around phenomenal person. And this party was amazing. And it went on until like three or four in the morning. And I looked around that room and I said, you know, this is the St. Louis that I know. But quite frankly, the elected officials act as if this version of the city just doesn't exist. And it's artists, it's actors, it's poets, it's philanthropists. It's everybody in the same room party and everybody knows each other. They're very well connected. It felt good. Uh, but when I leave that party, I'm back in a very tense situation. And uh, I think that uh, I've, I've, op I've often wondered, like, how do we fix that? And I think the, uh, the institutions are doing what they can for the most part, I believe. Uh, but I believe that the elected officials have to also recognize that this is a city of artists. And if you want to bring progression in, you have to start recognizing the artists at every nook and cranny in this town. Hi. I am um, very grateful to be able to step forward to the mic, but also um, terrified, and I'll tell you why. My name is Tamara Coolish. I am an artist, I'm an author, a blogger, and I'm a baby American. I became an American in um, August, and my daughter became an American in September. Um, we've been here for about just a little under half her life, she's 30. And um, only after we became citizens did we understand freedom of speech. We've been in the US for a few years and um, we were, um, acutely aware that we couldn't post on social media. I couldn't write on my blog. There was certain things that we couldn't say because we were afraid that we could be deported on a technicality. She has three children. The twins are 11 and the little one is seven now. She's a two-time cancer survivor. And, um, you know, we've gone through a lot here. But if we were deported, we wouldn't see the kids for a few years because we wouldn't be allowed back in the country for, what, six years? So being able to step forward to a microphone 
in public um, where I am participating in a conversation that um, many people, um, just simply by me being here, could have been one of those technicalities previously that could have, you know, gotten under somebody's skin and um, <coughs> had me deported. So I am very grateful to be here. Um, I'm grateful that we can all be here and um, and have conversations. We can listen. Um, I'm starting a whole new phase of my life, knowing that I have um, I have freedoms that I didn't have before, and um, I want to look at that carefully. When I write, um, I try and write about um, personal change, taking responsibility, um, being positive. I have shied away from any hot topic, hot button things. Um, instead, I try and word things in a way that would be um, uh, non-offensive, that nobody could take offense to. I think um, I'm realizing that um, this change in freedom, um, and I'm probably only going to be just discovering it, um, will allow me to find a voice. Um, so if you have any advice or feedback, um, any thoughts, I would um, greatly appreciate it. Thank you. That's heavy. First off, uh, can I have a hug? Give me a hug. So, I got these tears tattooed on my eyes so I wouldn't have to cry, you know, in public. Um, um, so my advice is, um, it's gonna come to you. Don't force it, right? Don't think that you have to, uh, for lack of a better term, overcompensate, right? Just let it come naturally. Um, something will hit you. It will spark you. It will, many of us, um, I could especially speak for Tev, I didn't know. I wasn't the most outspoken person. I used to be terrified in front of people. Um, but something's going to happen that's going to trigger um, that inside of you that makes you want to take it up a notch. Just don't force it. Just let it come naturally and organically. That's, that's my advice. And know that your voice is important to be heard. It, it values, it, it is mattered. There is somebody out there who needs and wants to hear it. And I'm going to say what my grandmother would tell me is to keep telling your testimony and hold that story near, near to your heart. And a lot of times people try to convince other people that they have to be these great big figures of social change, but the most revolutionary thing that you can do is take care of your family and that's what you're doing and we have to applaud that so I thank you for that alone and uh, in due time uh, these things will come to you you know and, and, and you're already critically thinking about them and you're feeling things that you haven't felt before and eventually you're gonna want to tell your story more and I think I don't know you but I just feel that there's something about telling your story that will change other people's life thank you just keep doing what you did right there. <laughs>